Very good. So here I am again. Okay. And uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit more about the, uh, uh, the, the next level at which we've developed uh, and some applications into not only student training, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know, regular scientific uh, payloads. Uh, this is uh, a program uh, that uh, when, you, when you go and you develop uh, uh, balloon payloads, uh, generally the scientific ones are like a, a single payload per shot. Okay? When we're doing our sounding balloons, we always have these multiple student payloads on here. But when we go down to Antarctica or Sweden or Australia or something like that, this is usually a single experiment dedicated to a single balloon on a 11 million or a 40 million cubic foot balloon of some sort. Okay? Uh, when you are doing that scientific development, you are putting together a whole bunch of, of custom systems for doing telemetry, uh, uh, power, uh, et, et cetera that go into your costs, um, your personnel, uh, time, as well as money. Uh, typically, one of these large uh, experiments uh, can take three to five years to put together and several million dollars. Uh, the other way, and uh, this may in fact be the only possibility if you have large experiments like BLAST uh, that we saw, or ATTIC, or some of these others, which are either heavy or have large apertures. You may have to do that. However, if you have a smaller system, like coronal graphs or spectrometers or other kinds of things, uh, one could conceive of uh, clustering these things together onto a single platform and using common resources, common tele uh, telemetry, et cetera. And the advantage for scientists there is that now you have uh, uh, spent your time on your experiment alone rather than all the custom flight systems. Um, so uh, we have some experience with this. In fact, uh, we have partnered with uh, the NASA Balloon uh, Program Office uh, to develop a, a multi-payload platform. This was specifically designed for students. However, there are a number of lessons that we have learned with this that could make this thing applicable to a uh, to scientific program. Uh, HASP is, in fact, the first balloon carrier uh, to uh, what, which was specifically designed with a uh, standardized interface to carry multiple experiments for an extended period of time uh, aloft. Uh, we started this in 2005, uh, again, sort of as a response to the looming crisis of lack of scientists and engineers uh, in the U.S., and we fly this every year, once a year, uh, with last year being an exception, <clears throat> uh, but every year is the idea so that there is a regular flight program available for, for students. Uh, it is a multiple experiment balloon platform, so something like that, similar to HASP, might have application going beyond just student training type things. So here's what HASP uh, looks like. Uh, getting ready for, for flight. We go up to about 36 kilometers, 120,000 feet, uh, and we're up there for on the order of 15 to 20 hours uh, at, uh, at float. Uh, we have two major components. One is the HAS system itself, uh, which is sort of, uh, which was built and maintained at, uh, at LSU. Uh, and the other part is uh, from CSBF, which uh, contains things, uh, among other things, uh, the, the uh, support instrument package, which is the, the main balloon uh, uh, controller and transmitter and things like that for uh, uh, termination, et cetera. Um, the uh, part up here uh, interfaces between all the student payloads. Uh, we have uh, eight small payloads on these sort of uh, fiberglass uh, booms. We also have seats for four uh, large payloads in the, uh, in the central area. Uh, HASP itself multiplexes the telemetry streams from all these uh, uh, four payloads, condenses that down into uh, one stream that is then presented to, uh, to CSBF. Likewise, HASP provides power for each one of these uh, payloads as well. We also have another device uh, called Cosmocam, which is on here, which is an uh, in-flight uh, webcam, which provides uh, video uh, throughout the flight. 
Uh, the standard interface that we use on, on Haas looks something like this. Uh, we have two classes, small payloads and large payloads, which have slightly different resource capabilities. Uh, large payloads uh, can go up to 20 kilograms a shot. Uh, small payloads are 3 kilograms. Uh, and uh, small payloads are a little bit smaller and use a slightly different, uh, smaller footprint. Large payloads can be uh, much, much larger than that. Both of them are supplied with about 30 volts uh, uh, DC. Uh, you get uh, anywhere from 0.5 to 2.5 amps of, amps of power supplied uh, during flight. Uh, and uh, uplink and downlink telemetry capability uh, were generally around uh, the 1,200, 4,800 uh, 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 bits per second. We're a little bit flexible in this. We do negotiate with uh, students, depending upon how many payloads actually run uh, telemetry. Uh, our total downlink cable, uh, uh, our total downlink uh, is, is limited by, by what CSBF runs, so we can actually allocate uh, that, uh, that bit rate a little bit uh, differently, depending upon what the, what the actual payload's needs are. And we can also uplink commands, uh, and there are uh, discrete commands for doing uh, event type uh, uh, things as well. So this is, uh, this is the sort of standard interface that, uh, uh, that we, uh, we apply. Uh, CosmoCamp uh, has, uh, has a number of features. Uh, it's, it's not only interesting right, and exciting uh, to see uh, the flight uh, in real time at altitude. It's exciting for the students. But it also has scientific value. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a Montana experiment, which was uh, set up to uh, capture dust, stratospheric dust. And um, it was very valuable for us to not only send the commands to open their capture device, but also to visually see that those commands executed. Okay? So it has, that, it has that value. We've also had other payloads on HAFs which have had opening apertures, et cetera. So having that Having that visual uh, feedback is, has been uh, uh, very, uh, very valuable. Uh, also, in, uh, for things like, like this, where uh, closure is critical, uh, again, it's very important to see that device closed and safe uh, prior to, to termination. So, uh, uh, so not only is it, uh, is it cool, but it's also uh, uh, valuable. Um, we fly out of uh, uh, Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Um, to prepare for that, the typical kind of schedule that we follow during the academic year is something like this. Uh, we will release a call for payloads around October 1st. Uh, and in fact, when I talked with Dave Pierce yesterday, uh, we are planning to go for at least another three to four years with, with HASP again. So there will be another call for payloads uh, this October uh, for the flight, uh, for the 2012 flight. Uh, and those applications are due mid-December, uh, usually due mid-December. We review these and make a decision about which payloads get supported uh, mid-January. Um, during the development, which is during spring, we have a monthly telecon uh, and a monthly status report that, that comes in. And uh, Lord help the student group that doesn't send in their monthly status report. Okay? Uh, we have a preliminary uh, thermal vac test offered the third week of May uh, using facilities at CSBF. Um, and sometimes groups take advantage of that, sometimes they don't. Uh, the official integration is the first week in August where uh, groups have to come uh, to CSBF, integrate with HASP, and we have two opportunities to become flight certified by passing through a thermal vac uh, test. We basically integrate the payloads, put them all into a large uh, thermal vac chamber, and go through pressure and thermal stress tests. Uh, the groups have two chances to deal with that. First time, uh, probably about 50% of the payloads manage to make it. The other 50% have a day to resolve their issues. Then they have a last chance to get slight flight certified. If they make that, great. If they don't, then their funding agency gets notified as to whether or not they are flight certified. And that funding agency uh, then makes the decision as to whether or not they're going to pay more money into that student group to allow them to fly. Okay? So um, 
because uh, I don't make that decision. We actually don't charge. BPO and we do not charge the student groups for a flight seat, okay? It's available free of charge. You get accepted, you get a flight seat, okay? So the space grant or whoever gives the student group money to do these things, they got to decide whether or not their money is being well spent if these guys don't succeed in the, in the uh, uh, flight certification. Uh, we usually fly uh, around Labor Day, uh, first week in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in September. Uh, from Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Fort Sumner, New Mexico? Okay. So this is the land of antelope. George likes to kill things. So when he comes down to Fort Sumner, he can go and shoot antelopes. Um, we also have wonderful tarantulas, good big ones, uh, rattlesnakes. Uh, in fact, one of the CSBF guys makes a habit of collecting ra uh, rattlesnakes, uh, uh, cactus, uh, UFOs. This is just a little bit north of uh, Roswell, um, the Billy the Kid Inn. And also Billy the Kid is just down the road. He's still in prison, even though he's been dead for over 100 years. 50 years, okay? Carlsbad Cavern, Wood Farms, there's the hangar that we use. So uh, Fort Sumner is a really excellent place to, uh, uh, to fly balloons. Uh, there's nothing out there. There's no trees, no swamps, okay? None of that stuff, pretty flat. Um, here we are uh, uh, preparing. Uh, we'll, we'll generally arrive about a week uh, before flight at Fort Sumner and get the balloon payload set, integrated with the CSBF equipment, get the student payloads on there, make certain everybody is checked out, load our batteries, uh, otherwise known as sticks of dynamite, uh, and uh, uh, get everything ready to go. Uh, here I am uh, helping to repair one of the student payloads. Note the uh, very precision uh, uh, instruments that I'm using, uh, et cetera. So we go through, uh, finally we uh, end up with a compatibility test uh, and verify that all communication links are working. Uh, and then uh, go through our final FRR and, and are then certified to, to, to fly. Uh, flight day usually starts about 2 o'clock in the morning. We show up on site there, get everything ready, uh, get HASP attached to the uh, 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 vehicle, and uh, drive out to the, uh, to the flight line. Uh, if we're approved for flight, if the weather looks like it's going to hold, they'll lay out the parachute. Uh, if later on it still looks like it's good, they'll lay out the balloon. Once we get everything ready to go, they'll inflate the balloon. Get the balloon ready, and then we'll have, we'll have launch in there. Uh, the launch itself uh, uh, uses, or our balloon uses, a 11 million cubic foot uh, uh, balloon uh, for that. And uh, this is actually eight times normal speed from Kazukam watching the launch. Uh, the vehicle drives along. You saw one of those videos yesterday, I think Dave had. But this is from the point of view of HASP itself looking up. And you see the, uh, the vehicle driving along. Make certain that you're uh, directly underneath that balloon as it comes up and then, and then flying. Uh, here's a picture that we took in 2009 through a telescope uh, of HASP at float. So you see the full balloon uh, entirely uh, uh, inflated at this point. We have gone through f about four of these flights, got a total of about 75 hours at float uh, those four years, so the average is around 17 hours uh, per flight. Uh, we've had, uh, 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 and these are sort of the typical sort of trajectories and flight profiles that we have. We launch at Fort Sumner and sort of head due west, roughly due west, something like that, and we're up at about 120,000 feet. We'll go through one sunset usually. Sunset usually is around here, okay? You can see right where it's about drooping, somewhere on there is about sunset. They'll drop some ballast, bring us back up. So you'll have mostly a day and you'll have some night, all right, in which to uh, uh, test payloads. Uh, these are the longest flights that we've ever had and the shortest flight that we've ever had. Um, here, uh, uh, you know, uh, unlike some of these more traditional flights where we go from east to west, here we managed to hit turnaround exactly right, okay? And this was, a, this was a fortuitous event, and there is a number of reasons why it is very unlikely this will ever happen again, not the least of which is I don't like to be up continuously for 34 hours, okay? So um, it is unlikely that this is, this is the standard. This is more the standard, or the ones on the other side are more the, more the standard that we would have. 
But this was an uh, exceptionally log, uh, log flight. But you can get those kinds of log flights if you, if you actually try. Um, HASP is, in fact, extremely robust. Uh, we have, uh, over, the, over the four landings, we've had remarkably little damage to the, to the core systems. Uh, we will always get these fiberglass beams broken, at least some of them, but many of them still remain intact, and many of the uh, balloon payloads, if they do their proper uh, shock testing correctly and FEA analysis correctly, they survive the landing quite well as well. So, uh, in fact, we have had virtually no damage to our core uh, electronics. Uh, there are sometimes uh, some of these little solar panel get a little bit dinged up, but in fact, it's, it's a very robust system. Uh, and that's actually going to become very critical this year. Uh, here is a map of the states that have been involved uh, in HASP over the years, and the numbers are the number of different institutions uh, in those states that have been involved here. I notice that uh, Iowa is still a red state. Okay, we have to change that, Matthew. Okay, and you, the rest of you folks, you guys know which state you're in, so you know which one you are. Okay, so uh, uh, send your applications in. Uh, we've had a very good uh, response over the years. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things that happened as a consequence of the mishap last year is that the fall campaign at, uh, of Fort Sumner was canceled, so we could not fly HAS 2010. Instead, HAS 2010 will be scheduled for this fall. Uh, in fact, uh, HAS 2010 is going to be scheduled to fly one week before HAS 2011. So we're going to try for the first time this year to actually recycle a balloon payload in less than a week. Okay? As far as I know, okay, that is probably the fastest that any kind of a major balloon payload like this has ever been attempted to be refurbished. We'll see how well it works. Okay? Um, we think it's, it's feasible to do that. To date, we've had over 370 students from 27 institutions across 14 states uh, involved. And that's included Puerto Rico. And this year, uh, we received permission from NASA to include international uh, teams now. So we've got our first international team from Alberta, uh, Canada, who's involved. And um, hopefully, we'll get some other uh, international groups uh, in involved as well in this. Here's some of our uh, statistics from our flights. Uh, these two flights down here. Uh, we obviously haven't flown. I've just got tentative dates as to what we're targeting for uh, 2010 and, and 2011 down here. Uh, so we've had uh, 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 that this number of students has been involved in those kinds of uh, uh, payloads, but we don't know what the success rate is. Um, those uh, those quality or those uh, uh, categories, uh, accepted, flown, and success, have very specific definitions. Uh, in particular. Accepted uh, payloads are those that we approve through their application. We accepted them for flight, for seat on, 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 uh, on, uh, on uh, pass. And uh, there's been a total of 63 uh, accepted all the way uh, through this year. Uh, for those that we have gone through flight years, there's about 43 of those. Uh, flown payloads are, in fact, defined to be those payloads that, in fact, are on HASP when we pull the pin and let the balloon go, okay? Those are the flown payloads. And so uh, out of those, 42, 36 actually end up being on HASP when we, when we launch. Uh, so that's about 86% of the guys who say that they're going to have a payload back in December to those that actually end up showing up with a payload on, on, on HASP. So that's not bad, okay? Um, successful. Uh, balloon payloads, we define as those that have at least 50% of their proposed sensors functioning for at least a quarter of the time that they're at float. Right? Low standards, this is a student training program. If we were doing regular science stuff, those standards would be a lot higher. But still, we've got about 26 have been defined to be uh, uh, successful compared to that 36, so that's about 70. 70% who launch are actually successful in this, in this definition. 
there have been a number of different kinds of experiments that have done. Uh, here I've sort of classified these things in, in uh, general kinds of categories. And you can see the very broad distribution of the things that the students have come up with uh, uh, to fly on HASP. Uh, most popular is cosmic rays, uh, and followed by things like uh, CubeSat prototype uh, uh, testing, uh, as well as remote sensing. So there's, uh, there's a variety of these things. Uh, there's also some uh, more rare ones. Uh, there was one group from uh, 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 LSU that was doing uh, rocket nozzle comparison. They had two different, several different kinds of rocket nozzles, and they had them on uh, load cells, and as we were going up, they would uh, e e uh, expend nitrogen gas, pressurized nitrogen gas from these nozzles and we measure the, the relative thrust. That was kind of an interesting one. Uh, so there's a variety of things. This is a picture of the uh, uh, University of Colorado Boulder uh, telescope uh, prototype that they're trying to fly over there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is probably one of the, the payloads that I'm uh, at actually uh, uh, talk about the most because it's one of the more interesting ones. This is a collaboration between students in the University of uh, North Dakota with students at the University of, of North Florida. I mean, what they have in common is the word north, okay? Um, the group in North Florida is uh, actually sort of a material science group. They develop sensors, uh, little solid state sensors uh, for measuring ozone as well as other reactive gases. The group in North Dakota then collaborates with Florida with those sensors and develops a balloon payload, all right? This has been a, a very productive collaboration for several years now uh, where they've been, uh, been flying these things. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's interesting that they're able to make that, make that work. Here's an example of some of the science results that have come out of these payloads. Um, this is, in fact, uh, the sensor board that uh, North Florida uh, sends up to uh, North Dakota to, to fly. And there's one of their uh, first me ozone measurements on a, on a HAS flight. Uh, which mimics very well, well, actually not mimics, but it, it measures uh, the ozone and that, that looks very much like the, the expected uh, uh, profile that you would normally get. Um, this is the rocket engine uh, test uh, payload. Uh, here is what uh, uh, Montana believes is one of their cosmic dust particles that they identified in their, in their sampler. Uh, some remote sensing uh, image, uh, uh, the, uh, the University of Colorado, a uh, picture of uh, uh, some of the stars from the uh, uh, Big Dipper. And uh, this is also a uh, University of Colorado uh, picture of the rotation uh, rate of HASP. Uh, so in, so what, what this one is, this is a function of time, and this is total rotation value. The blue is, is their measurement, then they, uh, they unfolded this in order to get the red curve, which is the total rotation. So one of the things that's really interesting about this is that there are periods of time on HASP. HASP is not derotated. It's not controlled. All right? It's just swinging from the bottom of the, of the parachute. And so once we're, uh, there, there are long periods of time uh, here, up to an hour, where there's virtually no motion whatsoever. All right? And even at our highest rate of, of rotation, this is only about 18 degrees per minute. Okay? So it isn't that fast that it's rotating once we get. So these larger payloads larger balloons are probably less susceptible to some of these uh, 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 air uh, uh, clearance turbulence things that, that the small balloons uh, see, okay? All right, so um, uh, as I said, uh, well, here's actually a picture of HASP on its way up. Uh, HASP is one of the first uh, multi-payload uh, platforms to have been developed. Uh, we have a standard uh, interface. Uh, we've had more than 60 payloads accepted for flight and uh, we expect about 85% of those will actually end up, uh, end up flying, uh, and 70% of those will end up being successful. So that's not a bad uh, turnaround for the, for the investment. Uh, we are planning to fly this twice uh, this fall within a, a, a week. Uh, this, has, this has real implications for the future of HASS if we can actually do this rapid turnaround. That means that we could accept twice the number of payloads in a given year. Or we could do things like accept um, the same number of large payloads, but we could make them twice as heavy 
and have twice the footprint. So we just fly two on one flight. So we can imply, so there, there's a lot which, is, which implies if we can successfully go through and do this, uh, this fast turnaround. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much.